Ashley, um, and um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I will become a member of the Southeast chapter, um, and we'll get that worked out. Um, I've been at Vanderbilt for 15 years now. I came here as a fellow, as Ashley said, uh, and during my fellowship, I got involved in some group care nutrition work, um, and um, that kind of snowballed into a lot of different things. As Ashley said, I am one of the authors on the guidelines, uh, and I get asked to talk about the guidelines a fair amount. Uh, and we're not really going to talk about the guidelines tonight. Um, we're going to dig a lot deeper than that and talk about a couple of specific aspects of critical care nutrition that are addressed by the guidelines, um, but we're going to go kind of in-depth and in detail. Um, and I'm going to have to look at the screen with you because uh, that's how we're doing this. So real quickly, disclosures, I do consum some consulting work for a company called Avisa, uh, Cumberland Pharmaceuticals. I'm actually the director of their medical affairs. I have NIH research funding for sepsis, ARDS, and actually for critical care nutrition. Uh, and then probably the biggest uh, conflict of interest, if you want to call it that, is that I'm a member of the critical care nutrition guidelines uh, committee for Aspen and Society of Critical Care Medicine. What are we going to do? Understand the recent data about PN versus EN, parenteral versus enteral nutrition in critically ill patients. We'll talk about studies of trophic and permissive underfeeding in critically ill patients. Um, we'll discuss short-term and long-term benefits and harms of permissive underfeeding, um, and then kind of um, at the end take some questions. Sorry, we've got a little technical difficulty yeah. here, so I ended up we're frozen. <laughs> so she can hear, but she doesn't see the slides. Let's see. Ah, here we go. It's been so long since I made the sugar. I drank the sugar. I have Okay. All right, so a little background. We know malnutrition and critical illness is associated with worse outcomes. This has led many people for a long, long time to assume that if we treat patients, i.e. feed them, um, even if they're not malnourished, that that has to improve outcomes. Um, now I'm frozen. <laughs> Um, there are consensus statements that endorse enteral over parenteral, and we'll go through data that uh, lead to that. Uh, and then there are strong beliefs about timing, delivery, and composition of enteral nutrition. Um, the, the data are actually emerging on this, so um, I'll go through some of it. Um, but historically, it's been presumed that more and early enteral nutrition is, is the way to go, um, and that that's what we should be doing. This is a lot easier to kind of conceptualize if we talk about a case. So a 55-year-old man, gentleman, has systolic heart failure, diabetes, hypertension, atrial fibrillation, he's on Coumadin, uh, a pretty typical patient for us in the southeast. 
uh, presents with pneumonia and septic shock. He has new renal failure. His creatinine is now five. Uh, the emergency department intubates him, starts him on a little norepinephrine, and sends him upstairs to me in the medical ICU. Um, he's on 70% FiO2, 12 of beep, and his chest x-ray looks like he has ARDS. So if you're in a teaching institution like I am, the residents are all excited and they say, hey, how do you want to feed this guy, right? Uh, and you say, well, there are lots of questions about how we should feed him. Um, some of them include, should we feed enteral versus parenteral? Should we do gastric uh, feedings or post pyloric feedings? Uh, when should we start? Should we start now, now that he's come upstairs? Should we wait a few days? Should we use physiology and say, let's let him get out of shock first? Um, what should we feed him? Uh, what I call tube feed du jour, um, which at Vanderbilt I think changes every month. Um, there's a new du jour here every month. Usually about the time I figure it out, uh, Jessica will say to me, no, no, we, we now are doing you know something else. Uh, it's like, okay. Uh, versus a special formula. So a special formula um, may contain omega-3 fatty acids, uh, other antioxidants, those sorts of things. Uh, how much should we feed him? What should our goals be? Trophic versus permissive underfeeding versus full calorie. Uh, and then what safety measures while we feed should we employ, like gastric residual volumes, GI intolerances, et cetera. The green, enteral versus parenteral, and then the goals of the feeds will be the concepts that we'll go through in depth today. So enteral versus parenteral nutrition. So there are some benefits of enteral nutrition um, that we know uh, from animal studies um, that what we call using the gut will preserve the intestinal mucosal structure and function. So it maintains uh, intestinal microvilli height. It stimulates secretions in your intestine. Um, these are good things, brush border enzymes, which are digestive enzymes, endogenous peptides, secretory IgA and bile salts, which are actually immunomodulatory. Uh, this preserves tight junctions between epithelial cells, reduces intestinal permeability, promotes actually blood flow and motility, and all of those things we help, uh, we think helps prevent translocation of bacteria across the lining of our gut in our critically ill patients. Um, so we think using the gut is a good thing. There are pros and cons for both enteral and parenteral nutrition. Uh, pros for enteral are the things that we just talked about, the positives for the gut. Cons are obviously that there are sometimes difficulties in feeding our patients. They sometimes don't tolerate our feeds. Um, it requires monitoring uh, at the bedside. There's a risk of aspiration. If you flip and look at parenteral, parenteral has uh, decreased feeding intolerances or complications. It's usually easier to do. You hang a bag and you kind of let it run. Um, and usually, and I say this because of a study I'll show you during this talk, uh, you can deliver more calories. Um, but there's also some big cons for parenteral too. You actually have to have IV access. Um, there are clear data that you have more hyperglycemia, maybe more infections. We're still working through those data. Um, it's obviously not the natural route of feeding. Um, and then you lose all of the pros for the enteral for the uh, intestinal benefits. Up until kind of the mid-2000s, there were 13 legitimate trials comparing enteral and parenteral nutrition in ICU patients. They were all small, um, totaling 750 patients. None of them are blinded. Most of them don't use an intention to treat. Most of them aren't even randomized. Um, and three of them actually compared immune enhancing enteral nutrition versus parenteral. So lots of kind of limitations to, uh, to these data. But 11 of them reported mortality and seven of them reported infectious complications. And here's the meta-analysis of those 13 for mortality. Um, no difference in mortality. The relative risk is 1.05 um, for parenteral nutrition compared to enteral nutrition. There is a difference in uh, infectious complications. The relative risk was 0.62 for enteral, favoring enteral, so 38% lower risk of uh, infections with enteral nutrition. Um, again, only seven studies in about 550 patients. So these are older. Uh, lots of people who like parental nutrition said, you know, we've gotten better at doing this since those studies were, were published, and that's true. Um, we have better TPN solutions now. We uh, realized that glycemic control may actually matter. Uh, we actually started doing tight glycemic control. We have improved central line care, um, and maybe these um, uh, results from the meta-analysis in the past didn't hold true with this uh, advancement in kind of the way we do this. So a number of studies actually have now looked at that well, with recent evidence. Let's walk through some of them. So this is actually a study from what's called the ANZIX group, which is the Australia, New Zealand, ICU Society group. Um, they do a ton of big studies. 
Uh, they did this study, 31 hospitals, uh, 31 ICUs from Australia and New Zealand. Um, they had 1,300 critically ill adults, first 24 hours of ICU admission. Um, and the, the inclusion was that you had to have a relative contraindication to early enteral nutrition and you were expected to be in the ICU for at least two days. Okay. Uh, I actually reviewed this manuscript for JAMA and I asked in the review, what does this mean? What is a relative contraindication to nutrition? Unfortunately, I never got an answer, so I'm still not entirely sure. Although you'll see on the next slide, um, I think on this slide you'll see kind of an idea of who these patients are, which gives us an idea of what the thought is. The study was actually randomizing you to standard of care versus starting parental nutrition on day one and targeting goal calories by day three. In the parental nutrition group, you got a reminder for starting enteral nutrition on day three. In the standard of care group, everything was controlled by the team and you got no reminder and you could do kind of whatever you wanted with nutrition. <clears throat> the primary endpoint was 60 day mortality. The other endpoints uh, are mechanical ventilation duration, length of stay, infections. Um, here's the slide about who are these people, right? What, what does it mean with a relative contraindication to enteral nutrition? So they're largely um, 68 years old, they're a little bit older, 60% male, most of them are ventilated, but they're largely post-op patients. Um, Two-thirds of them are from the operating room, uh, and all, half of those are emergency surgeries. So they're not even elective OR surgeries, they're emergency surgeries. Uh, only 12% from the emergency department. And you can see they usually have a GI surgery. <clears throat> so these are patients that come out of the operating room after a GI surgery, they're in the SICU and somebody says, you know, I've just been in their abdomen two days ago. I'm not really that excited about feeding them enterally. Uh, and that's the relative contraindication to enteral nutrition. Not all of them, but most. Uh, um, differences in the, the amount of um, nutrition that's given. The first is the amount receiving enteral and parenteral nutrition on each day. Uh, the second is amount of kilocalories in each group. Um, the dark is the parental nutrition group, the dark circles, uh, and the last is the amount of protein. I don't know if I have a laser pointer. I'm scared to touch anything up here. <laughs> um, their primary endpoint was um, mortality, deaths by study day 60. There's no difference um, in deaths before study day 60. <clears throat> There's uh, no real difference in organ failures. Uh, you can look at this coagulation, uh, and it looks like the standard of care actually has more days without organ failure uh, for coagulation. Um, I think that's probably a multi-comparison uh, problem um, because nobody can explain how that, how that happens. Um, the authors do think this is a positive study because of this last line. Uh, and this last line says that patients in the early parental nutrition had a half a day, and this is a half of day per 10 patient ICU days. So out of 10 ICU days, one half of a day more off of mechanical ventilation, which means that if you're in an ICU for three weeks, you come off the vent one day earlier. Um, not really a big bang for our buck here. Um, but no signal of harm, at least in the parental nutrition group. About the same time, uh, published a little bit later, but about the same time, um, Harvey in the UK actually did a similar study, uh, 2,400 patients, randomized to enteral versus parenteral, but you didn't have to have a relative contraindication. This one you could get in as long as you uh, were able to tolerate both enteral or parenteral so that you could be randomized to either one. Um, and they did this for five days and their outcome was 30 day all cause mortality. Similar age, 14% surgical, so not as much of a surgical population as the DOIG study, um, and moderately ill. Uh, again, 83% ventilated. This figure I included, and this is the reason that I said we think you can deliver more calories by TPN, because this is actually what they delivered. Uh, and the top left is um, their SOFA score. The top right B, panel B, is protein intake, and C is caloric intake. The blue is parenteral, or purple, whatever color that is for y'all, uh, and the red or orange is enteral. And you can see there's no difference between the parenteral and the enteral. Uh, and if it turns out that they both got about 70% of their goal calories. Um, when you ask Harvey about this, they say this was a pragmatic trial. It was done in ICUs, even in the community, and this is just what they deliver. Um, and, you know, lots of people in the audience would say, well, how hard is it to get a TPN bag, hang it, run it at 65 cc's an hour for 24 hours, and you get the whole bag? Um, but that's not what happened in this study. Uh, in fact, most of the time, the TPN would get turned off, just like the enteral nutrition got turned off. Um, so they both got the same amount of calories uh, and protein, or similar amounts. 
Here's their primary outcome, death within 30 days, that top line. Again, no difference between the two. Um, they have a number of kind of free of organ failure supports, no difference between the two. Oops, I didn't realize I did that, sorry about that. Um, but they also prospectively looked at infectious complications uh, and didn't see any difference in infectious complications either. Um, so this makes a lot of people say, see, TPN is safe and there aren't any more infectious complications and we can still use it. The one, and I think that's probably true. The one caution I would say is that they only did TPN in this study for five days. Um, so it's a short term of TPN. Um, so I wouldn't extrapolate this to a patient who's on TPN for a month and say there aren't any increased infections on TPN um, because it's a lot easier, as you all know, to take care of a central line for five days than for 30 days. Um, in addition, um, there are um, no other harms with the PN group except that uh, the, well, this isn't except the enteral nutrition group had more hypoglycemia and more vomiting. Uh, and I think for those of us who do some of this, right, that doesn't surprise us. Um, if you're going to get hypoglycemic, it's more likely to be if we're giving you enteral nutrition that's been held. Uh, if you're going to vomit, uh, it's more likely when I'm putting something in your intestinal tract or your GI tract than, than if I'm hanging it from an IV. Um, but no other differences uh, in this study, including infectious complications, organ failure, free days, uh, and mortality. So summarizing these two, TPN didn't improve 60-day mortality in critically ill patients with a contraindication early in. Uh, it may have reduced time on the ventilator slightly, a one day in three weeks, um, but no difference in length of stay or infections. And from the calorie study, Harvey's study, initial TPN for five days had similar outcomes to enteral, including infections, with less hypoglycemia and vomit. There's a new meta-analysis out. Um, done by Gunnar Elke, um, still with Darren Highland as an author, but not the first author this time. Uh, and they've actually divided the, cap the studies now by whether the caloric intake is higher in the parenteral nutrition group, that's panel A, or similar um, between parenteral and enteral. Um, and you can see they try and, try and make a point that if you're giving more calories with parenteral and sometimes overfeeding with parenteral, uh, you may be worsening outcomes. Um, the relative risk is 1.58, although not statistically significant because there's a relatively few patients, there's only 225 patients in the PN greater than EN calorie group. But when the PN and EN are similar, the mortalities are very similar, relative risk 1.03. You say, well, what about infections? The same thing seems to hold with infections in the groups that got more calories from PN compared to EN. It looks like there may be an infection risk for PN. But in groups that had similar calories, the studies where there were similar calories, the relative risk is 0.94, uh, and infections looked similar between the two groups. All right, so that's just straight parenteral nutrition. What about if you take some patient who's getting a little enteral nutrition, and you say, I'm going to top you off, right, with some parenteral nutrition. You're only getting 40% of your total calories by enteral. I'm going to give you the other 60% by parenteral. Uh, and this we're calling supplemental parenteral nutrition. Uh, and obviously, you taper off the parenteral as the enteral increases. Um, up until the new ESPN guidelines come out, the guidelines will differ on what we say about this. Uh, the Europeans have always thought this was a good thing, and they did this routinely. Uh, we in the kind of this side of the ocean, the Canadians and ASPEN have said, um, wait to start supplemental parenteral nutrition. Uh, and this is actually what prompted uh, Michael Caesar actually to do his a panic study uh, and compare it. And you learn interesting things when you go to conferences. At American Thoracic Society, when they presented the results of this study, the APANIC study, uh, the editor of the New England Journal said they were going to reject this study. Uh, but before they were going to reject it, they actually did a survey of a bunch of critical care nutrition people across the world because they didn't believe that people really did it differently uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, and they actually found out that people in different parts of the world did do it differently. Uh, and the Europeans really did use a lot of supplemental PM, and we on this side kind of said, no, we never do that right in the first seven days. Uh, and so there was this controversy which made this uh, manuscript to them much more exciting and appealing. So this is called a PANIC. Uh, it's an open-label, multi-center study, randomized trial, seven ICUs in Belgium. Pretty small, only about 4,640 patients, right? Um, so I mean, that's I'm joking when I say small. That's a, that's a big study. Uh, and you had to be at nutrition risk, which was defined as an NRS score of at least three, um, meaning that you at least had some component of malnutrition and severity of illness. And then you were randomized to one of two arms. Um, the first arm is the European way, which was that you started supplemental PN on days one and two. Um, that was glucose for those days. 
and then you added in uh, actual uh, non-glucose calories on day three, or uh, you were randomized to the North American way, which was uh, you're not going to get any of that until day eight. So you're going to get a week of whatever you can get enterally, um, but no supplemental PN until day eight. Um, your parental nutrition was, was tapered off when you got to 80% of your goal calories, and if you fell below 50%, it was restarted. <clears throat> and those of you who know Greg Vandenberg, who was big in this study, um, she has a very, very, very explicit, strict, tight glucose control protocol, which was used in all these centers. Um, if you get the protocol, if you actually ask her to send it to you, it's 19 pages of protocol. Yeah, it's a, it's a strict protocol. <laughs> and they use it in her hospital. Um, but everybody else who tries to use it um, apparently can't read as well as her because we have like 20% hypoglycemia rates when we try and use it. So what did, they, what did they try and see if this changed? Their primary endpoint was a safety endpoint of whether or not you were alive and out of the ICU by day 8 uh, and then alive by day 90. Uh, and they also looked at ICU length of stay. These are people that we take care of, a little bit more men than women, average age about 64. Um, they probably aren't as big as our patients in the southeast, um, aren't as much fried food in, in Brussels and Belgium as there is in uh, Tennessee, um, but uh, so their BMI is a little lower, but they, you know, fifth of them have sepsis, um, almost half of them are in emergency admission, their Apache 2 score of 23 is a reasonable severity of illness. This is their trial to show you they got a separation of arms, so the top bars are total energy, left column is enteral, middle is parenteral, and the right is combined, and the bottom is um, the percent of calories by total entry, and total energy, sorry. Um, and you can see red is enteral and blue is the parenteral. Uh, the group that had early parenteral gets a lot of parenteral calories, but they get them during the first week, and the red, the enteral group, doesn't get any parenteral calories during the first week, um, not starting until the Here's their primary outcome, the top line, discharge alive from the ICU within eight days. Uh, and there is a statistically significant difference. It actually favors the late initiation group, uh, so the North American way. So we all cheer when we're at meetings about this, and we were right, we were right um, sort of thing. Um, but it favors the, the late initiation group. Um, and uh, otherwise, no real differences, no differences in death in the ICU and the hospital um, complications. Um, there was more hypoglycemia, again, in the late initiation group, the group that wasn't getting PN during the first seven days. Um, and uh, duration of stays are actually shorter in the late initiation group. The other thing they found, whoops, highlighted those. The other thing they found was these top group was that there were more infections in the early initiation group uh, of parenteral nutrition. So this made the rounds, there were lots of meetings about it, lots of presentations at national meetings or international meetings, uh, and um, honestly, the study took a hammering from a lot of people. A lot of people had a lot of criticisms. They said, well, your patients weren't really that sick. I don't know, Apache 23 is pretty sick in my mind. But they have a, like two-thirds of the patients were post-cabbage again, um, which is her, a lot of her population. Uh, and maybe this worked in the sickest population, you just didn't have enough of them. Um, the first two days was all glucose, so you hurt people with glucose administration. It has something to do with your tight glucose control, insulin infusion, 19-page protocol that nobody else can follow, um, and that limits generalizability to other ICUs. So they actually heard this uh, and said, that's fine, we'll kind of try and address those criticisms uh, in a post-hoc analysis. Uh, so this was published in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine, uh, with those of us in pulmonary who are too um, um, uh, stupid to remember that name, called the Blue Journal, um, and that's because it's blue. Um, it's a post-hoc analysis of the APANIC trial. They looked at mortality <laughs> and infections between the groups based off of the Apache 2 quartiles to try and address the, maybe it works in the sickest population, uh, and they excluded cardiac surgery patients to see if that had any effect. Uh, and then they also looked at overall calories, glucose, and protein. Um, to see if they could determine what the harm was from. Was it from calories? Was it from the glucose? Was it from the protein? Here's their breakdown by quartile. So top line is first Apache quartile, second Apache is the next line, third Apache is the third line, fourth Apache. Uh, and the other patients means that the cardiac surgery patients have been removed. So those are the non-cardiac surgery, that's the right hand column. Um, regardless of any of that, you can see there's no signal anywhere, so it doesn't look like uh, early PN works uh, in the sickest patients, the bottom row, the fourth quartile of, 
of uh, Apache. And then here's their calories, and this is really hard to understand. What they did was they took either day three, day five, or day seven. You had to be alive, so if you had died by that point, they excluded you. Um, and they looked at how many calories you received. The left hand is the early parental nutrition group, um, so there are a lot of parental nutrition. The right hand column is the late parental nutrition, so they're getting their calories by enteral nutrition, um, mostly uh, in these days, not by parental nutrition. And then the middle is total population. Uh, and you can kind of see that as you get, and the bottom um, tells you the, the calories, it's less than 30% of your goal, 30 to 50, 50 to 70, 70 to 90, and greater than 95. Uh, so those are your kind of dots. Uh, and you can see as you get more calories, uh, your um, likelihood of earlier ICU discharge alive goes down. Uh, and that's true whether you're getting them parenterally or whether you're getting them enterally. And I didn't show you because it becomes even more complicated, but it turns out that it's a flat signal for glucose uh, and it's actually a downward signal for protein. Uh, and so in something that most of us in the critical care nutrition world don't understand, at least in their study, it looked like providing more protein was harmful for you. Um, and most of us think um, that protein is good and we should be giving them more protein. So we're still working through exactly why that is and how that may be. So here's your summary of a panic. Early initiation within the first seven days, supplemental TPM, worse outcomes, lower alive discharge from the ICU by day eight, although no difference in ICU hospital or 90 day mortality, longer ICU stay, more infections, longer mechanical ventilation, longer hospital length of stay. Uh, and it looks like more calories are associated with the lower chance of being alive and protein appears to drive that, uh, not glucose. So for those of us that are in the critical care nutrition world and or do parental nutrition, that's a little bit of a buzzkill. Um, at the same time, uh, Heidegger in Switzerland uh, was also looking at a similar thing. So this is two hospitals in Switzerland. 305 patients, in order to get eligible, you had to receive less than 60% of your enteral nutrition by day three. You had to be expected to be in an ICU for at least five days and survive for at least seven days. Uh, and there were some exclusions, like if you're already getting TPN, if you're pregnant, et cetera. They randomized you to just keep getting your enteral nutrition or to try and top you off with supplemental parental nutrition for just four days, just days four to eight. Uh, and their primary endpoint was infection after that, so days nine to 28. Who are they? Similar patients, a uh, little bit more surgery, almost half are surgery, uh, and many of them are infected on admission. Here's what their study protocol looks like. So you can see kind of on the left, you get admitted to the ICU, you get set up for day three if you're getting less than 60% of your um, targeted calories by entry nutrition, you're eligible. Then you get randomized to the dotted line, which is keep doing what you're doing, or the intervention line, which is we're going to add supplemental parenteral nutrition for four days to get you to 100%. <clears throat> and then follow-up occurs from days 9 to 28 over here on the right-hand side. And they found a pretty big signal for uh, infections, a lower risk of infections if you got um, supplementary PN, 35% uh, lower risk of infections. Uh, and that left line is, uh, that left axis, the y-axis is proportion without nosocomial infection. So 27% with, with supplemental parenteral without over the course of 28 days versus 38% uh, if you just did enteral. So that excited a lot of people uh, until you kind of broke it down. And here's the actual infections. Uh, and if you look at pneumonia, bloodstream infection, UTI, abdominal infection, there's no difference in any of the arms. And in fact, all of the difference in the infections is in this other infection. Uh, and you look at the footnote and it says, other infections are skin, bone, soft tissue, ear, nose, throat, upper respiratory, and non-pulmonary intrathoracic infections. Um, those of us who do a lot of ICU work go, these aren't infections that happen in my ICU, right? Uh, I don't see a lot of ear, nose, throat infections occurring in my ICU. Um, and so this, you know, put a, put a little bit of a flag up of uh, the infections that I really care about, whether you're getting ventilator-associated pneumonia, bloodstream infection, even a, a catheter-associated urinary tract infection aren't different. Uh, in this group, uh, between the groups. And in addition, there are some differences in antibiotic days, but in the actual clinical outcomes that uh, you and my patients may care about, days in the ICU, days in the hospital, mortality, uh, there's no difference between the groups. <clears throat> so how do you summarize early parental nutrition? There's a little bit of conflicting results that 
this community is going to have to work through and figure out. Um, but there's no real benefit demonstrated in clinical outcomes. You can say, what about the, the group with the relative contraindication? They got off the ventilator one day out of a week earlier. Okay, maybe. Maybe that's a, a real beneficial outcome. Um, but other than that, um, nothing. Um, there's one study, the Apanic study, that suggests that early PN may have caused harm. Outside of that, you can flip it on its head and say, but all of these studies suggest that we can do parenteral nutrition really um, safely. And so if I feel strongly that this patient needs parenteral nutrition, it's probably safe um, for me to do it in this group. Um, and I would also say that none of these included the patients that we often, I often, put on parental nutrition, which are my patients that are malnourished coming in. Um, they were excluded from every single one of these studies. Um, and so having, we don't really have any data on if parental nutrition is good, bad, or indifferent uh, in that population. All right. So hopefully uh, with that, I've convinced you if the gut works, try and use it. Um, once you're trying to use the gut, then the question becomes, well, how aggressive do I need to be in, you know, getting this gut to, to work with all of the calories I can give it? There are limited data, I won't show them today, that suggest that starting enteral nutrition within 24 hours is beneficial, uh, especially in the trauma population. Um, those data don't address how much you have to start within the first 24 hours. Um, and still leaves open this, if I start my feeds within 24 hours, 48 hours, um, how aggressive do I need to be to get to goal, especially early in the course of, of critical illness. We know that enteral nutrition has a number of benefits beyond just providing calories. Uh, we talked a little bit about kind of the intestinal microvilli, preventing bacterial translocation. That's in this top group, kind of the GI responses, maintaining gut integrity. It also has immune responses. It maintains lymphoid tissue, um, promotes uh, lymphocyte uh, differentiation. Uh, it has metabolic responses. I have no idea why there's an arrow on there, but I apologize. Um, and then lastly, uh, at the higher dose, uh, it actually provides calories, maintains body mass, uh, maintains strength, uh, stimulates protein synthesis. So even at the lower doses, there's a number of benefits from enteral nutrition. There's a concept uh, put forth by um, Mary Glade called hormesis. Uh, and hormesis is that you get a beneficial or stimulatory effect uh, when you get something at a low dose, but a high dose is not so good for you uh, and actually has a, a detrimental effect, right? You say, well, that's silly. Is there any example? Alcohol. Alcohol is a great example, right? You go to the doctor, they say a little bit of wine keeps the doctor away. If you're drinking a whole bottle of wine at night, uh, at some point you're going to see the doctor because uh, that's <laughs> not going to be so good for you. Right? So alcohol is, uh, is a good example of this. And it could be that enteral nutrition may be an example of this too. So there's a concept called trophic feeds, and this is the lowest amount that's needed in order to maintain those top uh, bullets on the two slides previous, um, the mucosal benefits. Uh, and it's not really known if you happen to be a vet and you treat animals, we have better data in animals. Uh, if you treat dogs, you need about 10%. If you treat pigs, you need about 40% of your caloric requirement to maintain the intestinal um, uh, structure. It turns out that humans don't volunteer for these studies because, you know, after you get part of your calories, they take out, they want to take out part of your gut. Uh, and people don't like that uh, concept. Um, so the concept of trophic is just nourishment or growth, and it's a low volume, continuous feed just for the purpose of nourishing the mucosa, not for trying to maintain body strength, uh, protein synthesis, but just nourishing that mucosa. So this is a project that I took on as a fellow, um, and we looked at patients with acute respiratory failure that were going to be ventilated for at least two days. Uh, they were almost all medical patients. Um, about a fifth of them had acute lung injury or ARDS, and another fifth of them had pneumonia. Um, almost half of them were on pressors and enrollment, um, and you had to start feeds about a day after mechanical ventilation, so as early as we could get them started. Um, and for those of you who were at Vanderbilt at the time, uh, we were not in the medical ICU using gastric residual volumes before the study started. But because of the study, we said we probably need to use them in the study. If the low group gets a better outcome, people will claim we just fed people in the high group without any safety precautions at all and hurt them by that. So we implemented them for this study. Um, we implemented a high level. 300 at the time was a pretty high level. Um, now the data suggests that if you're going to do them, which I recommend against, but if you're going to do them, um, push it even higher than 300, 400, uh, 500. We randomized these 200 patients to trophic, which was 10 cc's per hour for up to six days, or full calories, which was trying to get you to goal feeds as soon as possible, but doing it safely. 
So there was this whole algorithm for checking residuals and checking for GI intolerances and trying to get you to goal feeds as soon as possible. Um, the full group has more diarrhea and more elevated residual volumes. That again is probably not a surprise to people. If you give more uh, enteral nutrition, enteral feeds, uh, you get more diarrhea and you'll have more elevated residuals. What about the outcomes? Our primary outcome was this ventilator free days, this middle one. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with this, in order to have a ventilator free day, you have to be both alive and off the ventilator. Okay, so you get no credit if you die and you get no credit if you're still in an ICU on the ventilator. Okay? Gordon Bernard, who was my mentor, used to like to say that the fastest way to get somebody off the ventilator is to kill them. Um, because in today's society, right, we don't have patients in the morgue. So if you want your vent runs to be two days or shorter, right, just you have your patient die on day two uh, because they don't get ventilated past then. So this is a way to offset those kind of competing risks. So in order to get a ventilator free day, you have to be both alive and off the ventilator. The same thing is true for ICU free days. You have to be alive and out of the ICU. Uh, and we didn't see any difference in days alive and off the ventilator, days alive and out of the ICU, or that top line death at hospital discharge um, between the two groups. We then took this into a large uh, thousand patient trial just with patients with ARDS. Uh, and this was done by the ARDS network that I was a part of at the time. It's still mostly medical patients, same pneumonia and sepsis, the same about 40% on pressors at enrollment. We pushed the gastric residual volume threshold up a little bit. Um, for those of you who know the OMEGA study, this was factorialized with for the first 272 patients, the OMEGA study. Um, and I'm not going to talk about that, but uh, that's just in full disclosure. So 508 randomized to trophic, 492 randomized to full calorie or goal feeds for the first six days. Again, ventilator free days is the primary endpoint. Did we actually do what we said we were going to do? So here's the calories delivered in the groups. Uh, and you can see the bottom uh, left panel, uh, the bottom group in that is the trophic, and they get about 400 calories a day. The top is the goal, and they get about 1,300 calories per day. If you like percent of the needs, it turns out that it's about 25 versus about 75% of your goal calories. So even the goal group doesn't get 100% of their goal calories um, because they vomited or because um, the nurses will hold them for a bath uh, or something like that. Um, but they got 75%, which it is actually in these studies pretty good delivery of, of percent calories. If you look at GI intolerances, they're actually higher in the full feeding group. Um, that you know, wasn't necessarily a surprise to us. But the one thing I would point out on the slide is, is that the left um, y-axis is percent of study days, of on-study days, um, of the patients um, that get the GI complication. And they're really low. The top of that is 20%. So diarrhea is pretty common. It occurs in even our trophic fed patients 16% of the time. Um, vomiting is different between the groups, but it turns out that it's only in about 2% of patient days um, that the patient vomits. So it's a really low number. Same thing with elevated residual volume. It was less than 5%, or I'm sorry, less than uh, 6% um, constipation, et cetera, et cetera. So they are more common in the full, but relatively uncommon in all groups. Here's our primary endpoint. Ventilator free days at the top, no difference between the two. ICU free days, no difference. 60-day mortality, no difference um, between the groups. Infectious complications, we looked at ventilator-associated pneumonia, uh, Clostridium difficile, and bacteremia, and actually didn't get any difference between um, the two groups. So Choi and colleagues actually took uh, those two studies that I just showed you, and then a couple other small studies, and did a meta-analysis of trophic versus full feeding. It's four randomized trials, 1,540 patients. Uh, I just showed you 1,200 of those 1,540 patients. Um, and the primary analysis is mortality. No difference in mortality between the groups. Um, interestingly, they divide their trophic into whether or not you got more than 33% of your goal or less than 33%. Uh, and if you are in the trophic, so not fully fed, but get more than a third of your goal calories uh, in that group, you actually have a lower mortality. Uh, that's ratio of 0.61. Provocative, uh, it's certainly not the definitive answer, but it's, it's certainly provocative. They didn't find any difference in hospital IC length of stay. And although the GI intolerances are higher in the full feeding group, uh, they are statistically significantly higher when you put together four of these studies. Say, so, well, that's good. Um, but what about patients without ARDS? What about non-US sites? What about additional data to support this? 
So this is actually called the PERMIT trial. Uh, it's done by Yassine Arabi, who is actually in Saudi Arabia. It was seven hospitals in Saudi Arabia and Canada, almost 900 critically ill patients. Again, mostly medical, um, almost all ventilated, and over half of them were on vasopressors at the time of the moment. Open label, randomized trial. What they did was they said, we're going to give permissive underfeeding, 40 to 60% of your goal calories. Um, that's one arm. The other arm uh, is actually going to be 70 to 100% of your goal calories, but we're going to give protein, supplemental protein, to the 40 to 60% group so that both groups get the same amount of protein. Uh, if you remember from uh, the slides I showed you in Eden, there's a difference in the amount of protein in the groups because we didn't supplement with protein. And so they're doing a similar type of study except they're giving their lower feeding group supplemental protein so that everybody gets the same amount of protein. And they go for up to 14 days. And they said, let's look at 90-day mortality. So here's what their study looks like. The left is actually calories. And you can see they get about 80% in their high feeding group, about 50% in their low feeding group. The right arm is actually protein, uh, and they're really, really similar between the two groups and their protein. The one thing you should, you should process while you're looking at this protein, though, is that this protein intake is still less than one gram of protein per kilo per patient per day. Okay? Um, usually the recommendation is 1.2. Sometimes it's even up from that, depending on the severity of illness. Um, so this still falls a little bit below most guidelines recommendations for protein, even though it's the same between the arms. Um, it's still hypoproteinemic feeding um, compared to what most think is what we should be doing. Here's their primary outcome, death by 90 days. It's hard to see. It's the top. There's absolutely no difference. Uh, they looked at a ton of things. I see length of stay, duration, mechanical ventilation, blah, 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 blah. They didn't see a difference in anything um, except this very bottom, which I've cut out, which is incident renal replacement therapy, so new dialysis. And it's actually higher in the um, regular feeding group, 11.4 uh, versus 7.1%. Um, honestly, uh, I don't know what to make of this, and I suspect it's not a real difference. Uh, it's just if you do stats on enough things, uh, you eventually will find something. Um, Arabi and nobody from their group can actually explain why this would happen. Um, if we believe that protein causes uremia, you could believe that in our study, for example, well, one group got more protein than the other, that maybe more protein caused more uremia. But this study, they got the same amount of protein, um, and so it doesn't make much sense to me. Here's their Kaplan-Meier curve. Uh, they're pretty close to being right on top of each other, um, so no difference in this group. Uh, and then uh, the last, I think, study that I'll show you in this realm, um, I think, was a joke um, by Lancet, Lancet Respiratory Medicine, uh, uh, which is a United Kingdom publication. Uh, and I think it was a joke for the Americans because this was published uh, two Thanksgivings ago, actually on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, and it's actually uh, management of refeeding syndrome in the critical field. So I see no reason that this could be a coincidence that they would publish a refeeding syndrome study on Thanksgiving Day um, for the Americans. Uh, unless they were just kind of trying to, to needle us. Um, maybe it's coincidence, I don't know, but I'm not buying it. Uh, 340 patients, it's that same ANZICS group uh, in Australia and New Zealand. They define refeeding syndrome different than we did. Their refeeding syndrome is you started full feeds, and if within the first three days you had hypophosphatemia, your phosphorus went low, then you were eligible, and that was refeeding syndrome. Um, and we think about it a little bit differently here, but it's not that hard to identify these patients if you know that you just need to check a phosphorus for the first three days. Um, they're not patients, for example, and most of them in this study are not malnourished patients that hadn't been eating. Um, that's not how they define it. Um, they did a randomized trial. It is blinded, uh, standard versus restricted calories. Their standard was they continued to advance to full enteral nutrition, repleting phosphorus as much as they could. Uh, the restricted is uh, they backed you off to 20 kilocalories per hour, which is very similar to our trophic feeding group, uh, until you didn't need your phosphorus repleted for at least two days. Um, and it turned out that that was about five days, um, but uh, it wasn't a set time. Uh, it was they checked your phosphorus every day, and then when you had two days that it was normal and you didn't need repletion, they advanced your, bowl, your feeds. Their primary outcome was days alive and outside of the ICU, mostly medical um, and mostly ventilated. So here's their actual uh, outcome, ICU discharge status. Uh, no difference between um, the two in ICU discharge status. Hospital discharge status actually favors um, the um, backing off the 20 kilocalorie group. 91% um, were alive and able to be discharged from the hospital versus 82% when they continued to fully feed them. And I'll show you this in a Kaplan-Meier curve. 
Um, and their length of stay actually goes the other way. Their hospital length of stay is a little bit longer uh, in the group that they backed off. Before I show you the Kaplan-Meier, this is one of the most fascinating things to me about this study. Uh, and what they did was they looked at uh, how much phosphorus they had to give these patients. That's the top left. Uh, there's no difference in the amount of phosphorus given. Um, there's no difference in the bottom left, which is the proportion of patients getting phosphorus, or phosphate, sorry. Um, and uh, in the right, there's actually higher blood glucoses in the group that's getting full fed. And that probably makes some sense. They're getting more calories. They have higher blood glucoses. Um, but this bottom right panel is fascinating to me, which is the arterial lactates uh, are actually higher in the group that's fully fed. Um, I don't know why this is, uh, and I don't think it's related to ischemia. Um, one of my colleagues who does metabolomics things thinks that this may be related to a diversion of glucose. If your body can't use it, you convert it into lactate um, through the pyruvate uh, mechanism um, and thinks it's actually not a mechanism of underperfusion, uh, oxidative stress, but kind of a way to divert uh, excess glucose. Um, and since he's smarter than me, I'm going with his theory. Here's the Kaplan-Meier curve I told you I'd show you over time. Um, and you can see that the, the caloric management, which is the backing off to 20 kilocalories, actually has a long-term um, survival advantage uh, in these patients. Um, so pretty provocative. Uh, the last thing I'll go through, um, I don't know what time it is, 5.53, so we have time. Um, the last thing I'll go through is the effect of underfeeding on longer-term uh, outcomes. Um, and so lots of people have argued if you do trophic feeds or permissive underfeeding, maybe you're making patients weak six months down the road or a year down the road because they get behind and they never get caught up. So we actually, in our large 1,000 patient eating trial, had set out at the beginning long-term follow-up for 12 months. Uh, and this long-term follow-up was two ways. One was that we would um, call people and do quality of life and mental health uh, from anybody that was enrolled. Uh, and then there were five centers, Vanderbilt was one of them, run by Johns Hopkins that actually would go to patients and do physical and cognitive functioning tests. So that's not all the patients in the study. That was just five centers that would actually go and do physical and, and cognitive function tests. So here's the first, which is the mental and cognitive health. And this is hard to read because it's small, uh, but it was published in BMJ, British Medical Journal. Uh, and there's no difference in survival, no difference in cognitive or mental health um, um, or quality of life stuff uh, at um, one year between the two groups. This is actually the physical functioning. Uh, and again, although these bars are pretty wide because there's only about 280 patients that we actually went to, um, we couldn't find any difference in strength uh, at a year between the trophic and the full feeding groups, but the patients that obviously are alive. Um, so suggesting that we don't, we don't affect long-term outcomes um, by the, what we do in the first six days of feeding in, in the ICU. All right, so let's wrap this up. Back to our case. 55-year-old male, systolic heart failure, non-insulin-dependent diabetes, hypertension, atrial fibrillation, uh, presents with pneumonia, septic shock, has renal failure, is intubated on norepi, comes up uh, on 70% FiO2, PIPA 12 uh, with his ARDS. So the questions, how should we feed them? Feed him, sorry. Um, I would say let's try enteral. Uh, and in our, our, our um, Eden study, 90% uh, of the patients were fed gastric, um, feeding in the stomach. When I first started, uh, a bunch of the nutrition people said, you can't feed somebody in the stomach, it's critically ill. And it turns out that most patients you can. Uh, and if you're at a center like mine, it takes you three days or longer to get a post pyloric tube in. And that whole time you're jacking around with a post pyloric tube and not doing anything with feeds. Uh, and most of the patients, uh, our nurses in RIC will put in an OG tube uh, and they put it in almost as soon as we intubate a patient and you've got access and you can start feeding. If they have problems, they throw up a lot, you're getting high residuals if you're checking them, then you can think about, maybe I should move this to post pyloric. But you'll find that in the majority of your patients, you won't end up with a lot of those problems even feeding patients gastric. When should we start feeding them? Uh, I think the data for this are not very good right now, but based off of the data that we have, the minimal data that we have, uh, I would do it as soon as you can. Uh, if the patient is in severe shock, so for me that's more than 30 of norepi, they're on a balloon pump, they're on an epinephrine drip, um, you might want to wait. Uh, or if you're having to dial up your pressors pretty quickly, you might want to wait. But if you think they're pretty stable and on a stable amount of uh, vasopressors, I think you can feed them uh, and feed them pretty early. What do we feed them? I didn't show you the data on this. 
at least in the medical ICU, uh, I think it's tube feed du jour. Um, the immunonutrition stuff in the medical ICU hasn't panned out very well. The surgical ICU is a little bit different. There are some very provocative data about the immunonutrition in especially elective surgery patients. Um, and so that may be an area where um, a little omega-3 fatty acids, a little arginine uh, may be beneficial. But I do a lot of medical ICU work and in a medical ICU, um, whatever your hospital has negotiated is the best rate for their tube feed uh, is what we give our patients. Um, and usually it changes soon enough that the doctors have no idea what it is. Uh, how much should we feed them? I think any of these are allowable. Trophic, permissive underfeeding, um, full calorie. I think the, the data suggests that you get similar uh, clinical outcomes in any of those. Uh, and so I think any of those is, is a reasonable approach. Um, and then what safety measures are we doing? I didn't show you this. We're not doing residual volumes anymore. There are some data that suggests they don't uh, predict who's going to vomit. They don't predict who's going to aspirate. They don't improve outcomes. Uh, if you talk to your nurses, they hate it, right? Do we have any nurses here? None of y'all are nurses. The nurses hate this, right? They tell me routinely, this is the grossest thing we do. It's absolutely so gross to pull this out of somebody's stomach and then you make me give it back to them, right? Uh, which is true. We used to make them give, we used to make them give it back to them. Um, and so the nurses actually like the fact that they don't do this. I wouldn't say never do it. I would say don't do it routinely every six hours. If somebody has abdominal distension, if somebody threw up, if you think they might have regurgitation, it might be worth knowing what their residual volume is. Um, but I don't think it's helpful to just draw it back every six hours or every 12 hours on a patient and give it back to them. Uh, I do think clinical exam is probably important and that you should do exams um, about every six hours. So I get nervous um, saying this, but people ask me and they say, you know, what do you, what do, you do at Vanderbilt? And I get nervous because Jessica's in here and this is what Jessica does at Vanderbilt, uh, not me. Um, but what my, my mantra is and what I think I, I should do and I tell the nurses to do is start something within 24 hours. I tell them honestly, start in a trophy. And the reason is because there's a lot less resistance from them if they're just going to start at 10 cc's an hour. And you find out that if they're still on 10 cc's an hour at day three when the patient's no longer like, you know, they're throwing stuff around the room because there's so much going on, the nurse will often come to the team on rounds and say, hey, is it okay if I advance these to goal? Um, yep. You know, everything's calmed down. Have at it, right? Uh, I think the data suggests that you're not doing harm um, in that regard, and I think you can do it. Um, but I think using that trophic window and some of these trophic data to get feed started earlier um, is a window with, with the nursing staff. Um, because honestly, starting something at 10 cc an hour and running it, it's almost out of sight, out of mind. Um, they hardly even know that it's, that it's happening. Um, and so that's what I've told them. My, my view is and how I would you know, treat my critically ill patients and how I, I think we should be treating them. Um, here's the summary. After starting enteral nutrition within the first 24 to 48 hours, I don't think getting to target rates quickly improves outcomes, so I don't force people to do it. I let them do it on their own. Now, don't let them go a long time. Our studies went six days. So if you're outside of six days, at that point, I think you probably need to be providing calories. Um, I think starting with a trophic, as I talked about, can be sufficient. Um, I do think it's still unclear, and I think there are these groups out there, um, of who we should be really, really pushing to get to full. Um, we took pretty much all comers, and I think pushing every single one of your ICU patients to full is probably not uh, largely improving outcomes. But there may be subgroups that we should be pushing, whether they're malnourished subgroups, they're cancer subgroups, they're surgery subgroups, I don't know. I think we'll still do some um, research and studies in this realm to figure this out. Um, but I don't, I don't know what those subgroups are uh, right now. This is why they call it an ICU, right? Um, <laughs> And then uh, remind me, Ashley, how we're doing questions? Yeah, I think there should be. You're just going to ask them all? <laughs> Do we get first dibs on questions because we're in here? Yeah. Absolutely. Just I think you mentioned that um, malnourished patients were excluded. Yeah. So how do you, so that makes sense. If, if you're previously nourished, it doesn't really matter for a few yeah. days whether you get trophic feeds versus full feeds. How do you feel about malnourished patients being that so many, such a high percentage of patients coming to the ICU are malnourished? Yeah. So for those of, you, those of you who can't, couldn't hear Jessica, she asked, um, most of these studies, uh, maybe all of these studies exclude malnourished patients. Um, the one that may not is the, is the um, refeeding syndrome patient, um, although that didn't have a ton of malnourished patients in it. 
But what's what's the view on malnourished patients? Um, and um, do you think the same thing is true with trophic feeds? Uh, is PN a different beast in those patients? Um, and you know, I'm going to play a politician a little bit um, because I think the answer is we don't know. Um, we've largely been scared to study those patients, and we should study those patients um, because if the refeeding syndrome is true uh, and our malnourished patients fit that, then that would suggest we should start start slow for a few days and then ramp up. Um, but um, there's also a perfectly reasonable hypothesis that you've already, you're already malnourished, and two, three, five more days of worsening that malnourishment may be bad for you, and that we should start right away, or we should start with PN. Uh, and so I think those are areas that, that we need more information on. The other interesting area to me that, that we've, uh, we being the Critical Care Nutrition Guidelines group, has sort of taken a definitive stance on that we have no data for is this underfeeding, adding protein to the obese world. Um, and we say, oh, of course, yeah, right, you underfeed them, you target 50, 60%, you give them their full protein, and that's the right thing to do. And when you go look for those studies, they're not there. There are zero studies right, that suggest that that's the right thing to do. So I think you're going to see in the next five years that study being done too, where we actually look at that and say, uh, you know, we in the Southeast and Tennessee specifically have tons of obese patients, right? And I don't think we have any idea what the best way that we should be feeding our critically ill obese patients is. I'm either unable to use this or I have no questions. I don't think we I, I have a question. Yeah. So with that six day of trophic feeding and yeah. if you go beyond that, when do you pull the trigger for PN? What do you what's your thought? Yeah. Because their nutritional status is obviously deteriorating if you start going much beyond. Yeah. How and I know there's risks of of that versus some benefit, at least from the trophic feeding, but how do you know then when to pull the trigger? Uh, I don't. Um, but I start thinking about it at a week. At a and, week. Yeah. and it's not everybody at a week. Um, it also depends on the patient a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, if that patient's getting extubated at a week, I'm obviously less likely to do PN. If that patient, uh, you know, is somebody who's continuing to have GI issues and going to the operating room for GI stuff, blah, 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 sure. I'm way more likely to use PN in those patients. Um, but it's right at about a week that I start thinking about, um, you know, what am I going to do with parenteral nutrition in this patient? Um, it, it's a little arbitrary, but um, but that's about Yeah, it. without data. Yeah. Yeah. To sort of piggyback off, off of that question, too, would there then be a difference in, let's say you have a patient who you're waiting, 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 okay, we get to day six, we start thinking about PN versus someone like you were describing, we know not feeding this patient for five, six, yeah. eight, ten days. Would you then consider definitely yeah. PN? Like, is yeah. there a difference between no, just wait, 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 versus knowing they're going to get at least five to seven days of therapy if you start early? Um, potentially, um, I don't use a ton of early PN. Um, Jessica may say I use no early PN. Um, there are um, I no customers. From us. <laughs> I can I can vouch for yeah. 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 some more business from us. I know there are cohorts of patients that we get that come to us on PN um, that we will enterly feed. Right, the BMT patient, um, yeah, the sick you patient, um, and they'll often roll in. It'll be like this gut works, right? You know, Jessica will be like, yep, and we'll go, okay, let, and they have it too. Let's feed them. And the BMT people tell me, they say, you can't feed my patient. They have mucositis. I'm like, do I care about that, right? They got a tube going past all of their mucus and their stuff, right? Uh, so that, that's a different story. But um, so there are some early patients that come to us that we'll try and convert. Um, I, I mean, if you use Doing's data, um, it says that you can do it without harm. Um, and maybe you're, you're getting a little bit of benefit from it. Um, I just am not convinced the benefit if I start on day two or three is really there. Um, and it's just not that easy to do. But we use less central lines today. The patient needs a central line. Um, you know, they may get an infection, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so um, we just don't do a ton of it. So that's another question I had about central lines. Is there any discrepancy in some of these studies between patients who had these bacteremias or central line infections with parental nutrition who may have otherwise not had a central line yeah, or would the central line have been there anyway? Right. 
Right. And and the type of line matters, right? If you get a tunneled line, because I know you're going to be on parental nutrition at home or something like that, it has a much lower risk of getting infected than you know the line that my intern just put in to their second line ever uh, that has mm -hmm. you know the 14 bullet holes and the, <laughs> the subclavian because they've stuffed the patient 14 yeah. times. Um, so there's there's all kinds of differences in, in the infection things. Um, I, I think our line care is better, and I think the PN is better. That the risk of infection is lower. Um, obviously, the longer you do PN, you, you know you kind of add that risk for every day you're doing it. Um, but um, but I think we've done a better job with it. Do you think we have any more questions? I I mean, what, Atlanta like hates us, or Chattanooga's not liking us. Let's see if there's anything up here. Kentucky. For the technology, it's here. Yeah. 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 Yeah.